This is uh, quite the story, isn't it, in Luke? We've been going through different stories in the book of Luke. And let me, let me just say before I forget, if you would like prayer for healing, if you would like prayer for anxiety, whatever it is, after service, just come on up front and, and I'll be happy to pray for you. But this story is about a man who is isolated from community, who's naked, who harms himself, and who is under the complete control of demons. Have you ever met someone who's demonized? Have you ever seen someone who is demonized? In the Western world, it it seems that we don't encounter that very often. When I was in college, I, I think I mentioned this after my sophomore year in college or toward the end of that, the second semester of sophomore year, I was in this funk. I was in a depression almost. My thinking was constantly negative. It was almost like I was being suffocated by my own thoughts and was just able to keep moving forward, get my assignments done. But it was a, a rough period for me. And I got home from college and finished my finals. I hadn't been home for 24 hours, and my parents took me to a conference. And this conference happened to be on spiritual warfare, which involves demons and deliverance from demons. And I don't know that my parents were intending that. It just happened to be a conference they got invited to. They brought me along. And there was this one session, and this, we're going through it, and there was a list, and it was 12 signs you are demonically oppressed. And so these, this group was teaching there's a difference between possession. Possession is when you're under complete control. Oppression is just when there's demonic influence in your life. And so... I'm listening to this speaker. I'm a 20-year-old. My parents have brought me to this place. And there is this list of 12 reasons. And as we go through the list, you know, just bullet points. I'm going, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That one's not me. That's me. That's me. I was 10 of 12, which is a little bit unnerving. And I'm thinking, what? What? I'm a believer in Jesus. I've been following him since I'm a young man. How could I have 10 of 12? The session ends, and I'm trying to process this. I I go to the beach. It was on Lake Michigan, and I'm sitting there, and I have this sense that there is this darkness around me. But at the same time, I feel like I'm going to be free. So I go to the next session, and I said, I am going to get prayed for Now, there is an elderly man there, Victor Matthews was his name, former seminary professor at Grand Rapids Baptist Seminary. He's probably in his 80s. His wife was with him, very sweet, elderly woman. And I had this sense that this is me. I need freedom. That I don't understand this fully, but I, I think there's demonic oppression in my life. And so I went up to him and I was so timid, I could barely get the words out of my mouth. You know, he's this 80-something-year-old man, I'm 20, and I just say, I, I, I think I might be demonically oppressed. Could you pray for me? I just, I, it was almost a whisper. And, he, you know, he's this kind, gentle man. He just said, oh, yes. And his wife was there. And he grabs one hand, his wife grabs my right hand, and, you know, she's this, this little old woman, and they start praying for me. And, 
and my hand is going like this. And I'm thinking to myself, why is that woman shaking my hand? And she wasn't. I was the one who was doing it. And there was a moment as he's praying for me, he's just praying God's truth over me, God's freedom over me. And I hadn't told him anything, you know, other than I think I might be oppressed. And he prays. And then he says, and all you demons by Peter's back, go in the name of Jesus. And the moment he said that, I just kind of went like this. And at the end of that prayer, what happened is it just felt like this heaviness was lifted off me. You know, kind of like if you're swimming and, and you're fighting the waves, you're fighting the circumstances of life. It's tough. But if someone's on your back trying to push you under the water, it's really hard. And suddenly it felt like whatever that heaviness was, was gone. And I had to go back. I went to him that summer for counseling. And he just led me through the scriptures. And and basically he said, Peter, you need to know the truth. Because I had this mental tape in my mind. Peter, you're an idiot. Peter, nobody likes you. I can't believe you are so stupid. And this was just constant. This was the constant recording in my mind all day long. Every interaction, I'm so focused on how stupid I look and appear. And it's a really painful way to live. And what Victor Matthews said to me, he said, Peter, you need to know the truth and you need to proclaim God's truth in your mind and in your heart. The truth that you are loved, the truth that God is with you, that God is for you, that God has a plan for your life. The truth that Jesus is more powerful than the darkness. He said, when you get those negative thoughts, this is what I want you to do. When you, when you hear that thought that says you're such an idiot. You say, stop in the name of Jesus. I reject that thought. And so that's what I started doing. And it seemed like I was doing it nonstop. I'm rejecting about 65% of my own thoughts. But I had become so conditioned to the lies about who I was that I did not know how to proclaim the truth. And I needed to be active in that. And I needed to change the way that I thought. Now, this is my personal story. Why would I tell this story? You know, it'd it'd be nicer not to because you don't want, you don't always want to share these types of things publicly. But the Bible says that the saints in Revelation overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And some of you may have an experience like me when I was 20. That your thoughts are a constant barrage of negativity and fear and anxiety. And God may be using my story in your life and saying, you need prayer. You need to stand on the truth too. And so I share this, one, as an introduction to this text to let you know that it's personal but also that there is hope and there is freedom. And I don't get those thoughts anymore. And I'm not overwhelmed by anxiety and fear anymore and self-condemnation. And so if you're in that place, God can set you free. And the text we look at today, we see a man who is set free. Now, for us who've grown up in the West, our worldview doesn't really allow us to believe in the supernatural, right? We believe in science. We believe in what we can feel and touch. And so this idea that there are spiritual beings in another realm that can influence us is foreign. If you grew up in Taiwan, you know, we, spirits and ghosts are a part of culture. It's much easier to believe. But what I want to do is just take you through some scripture so that we see demons do have power. Demons are evil spirits who are opposed to God, and they have power. And so let's walk through a few scriptures so we know that what I'm teaching is not just from my mind or from some conference, but is actually what the Word of God tells us. So 1 Peter tells us this, 
Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil works to devour people. Jesus says this about Satan. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That Satan works to destroy relationships, to destroy people's careers, to destroy their families. We see how did demons influence or impact people. Luke 13, 11 says a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years was there. And she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Now, I want to be very clear that I do not believe that all sickness, all in illness is demonic. We live in a fallen world where there are viruses and there is disease and there is natural explanation for our illnesses. However, what we see in this text is for this particular woman, her condition was caused by an evil spirit. The next one we see is a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. That's Jesus. And he healed him so that the man spoke. And saw this man was impacted by a demon who made him blind and made it so he could not speak. But Jesus set him free. Luke 9 says this. Behold, a man from the crowd cried out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. Now, this is a condition that we would probably call epilepsy. And again, I wouldn't say that all epilepsy is demonic, but in this case, for this boy, the condition he had was caused by a demon. Demons have power. They're real and they can influence people. For the man in the story, this is what we see. This is how these demons impacted him. One thing is he's naked. He had known, worn, no clothes. If we can bring up the next slide. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. So not only is he naked, he's isolated. He's out by himself in a place where other people go. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So you see how the demon, the thief, comes to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. This man's life is being destroyed. He's naked. He's isolated. He's driven into the desert. Mark 5, the same story, it tells us that night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. So what night and day, the man cannot sleep. He doesn't, he's unable to rest. He's crying out. He is in deep anguish, cutting himself with stones. He's harming himself. So he's isolated. He's in great anguish. He's harming himself. He's naked. He's violent and he has no rest. This is a man who's under the control of demons and his life is being destroyed. Demons have power. But this story tells us very clearly that Jesus is stronger than demons. Demons do have real power, but Jesus' power is greater And as soon as Jesus steps on the shore, the man comes running to him, kneels down before him and says, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg of you, do not torment me. The demons within the man recognized the position and the authority of Christ. That this Jesus is the son of God and that he has power and authority over them. The darkness is strong, but the light is stronger. In fact, a young child 
filled with the Spirit of God through belief in Jesus Christ, has authority over demons. In Korea, one of the the common things that occurs to people at night is where you're lying in bed and there is a presence that presses upon you so you cannot move. It's so common, they actually have a word for it. It's called kawi. When I first went to, when I went to Korea the second time, this was 2005, I was teaching at a school and it, for the first three weeks I was at this school, every night, this is what happened to me. I'm lying in bed and I'm woken in the middle of the night and there is this dark presence pressing on me. I cannot move and, and you just feel terrified. It's so common, there's a, a word for it in Korean. And yet, you cry on the name of Jesus, you call out, Jesus, help me, it's instantly gone. You see, the name of Jesus is powerful, and Jesus has all authority over all demons. And so there's no reason to be afraid of demons, or to feel that we're subject to them, or we're in danger of them, or what happens, what do I need to do so I'm not harmed by demons? We don't have to worry about that, because Jesus within us is stronger than the demons. And all we do is call on his name. And so maybe you have a superstitious family and we need to do this to keep the evil spirits away. We need to do that to keep the evil spirits away. We need to appease them so they don't touch us. All you need is the name of Jesus. All you need is Christ in you. And it's not a magic trick. It's not something, well, I'll just say his name. No, you have a living relationship with the living God, and he is stronger than all evil spirits. In fact, we see in Luke 9, this is the very next chapter. Jesus called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons. Jesus gave his followers authority over all demons. Demons have power, but we don't need to be afraid of them. Jesus is stronger, and he gives us authority over them to command them to go, to leave us alone. So Jesus has power over demons. Jesus restores tormented people. Jesus restores tormented people. Next slide. Jesus finds this man. He commands the demons to go. And where do the demons go? You know, they beg, send us into the pigs that are on the hill. Jesus allows them to go to the, into the pigs. The pigs rush down the hill and are drowned. And it is a picture. It shows us what demons do. Demons kill. Satan destroys. In Kenya, there's witchcraft is common. And you're looking for spiritual power to help you get things that you want, whether it's a job, money, spouse. And what the pastors there will say is that the devil never gives a free gift. And so people go seeking power, spiritual power, spiritual help outside of God, whether it's to a fortune teller or a witch doctor saying, what's my fortune? What is going to happen in my future? And there's power in that. There's power in the occult. But it's evil power. And Satan doesn't give free gifts. His mission is to destroy. And we see that so clearly in the pigs. They're totally destroyed. That's what they do. But what does Jesus do to this man who's in anguish, who's naked, who's isolated, who has to live alone, who's cutting himself? The demons are driven out and he's restored. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And the people were afraid. 
They knew this man. Imagine if there was a man in Tianmu who walked around the streets naked, who lived up in the mountain, and you could hear him at night howling. And you walk by him, and he's hitting himself with rocks, and he's living among the tombs. Everybody knows the man. It says they bound him with shackles and chains, but he would break the bonds. Everybody knows this man and how destroyed his life is, how messed up his life is. Everybody, you stay away. You tell your children, stay away from that man. But you know, that man was once a little boy. He was once a little boy who laughed and played and had hopes and dreams to have a family. And we don't know how it happened, but somehow he became under the complete control of demons. And Jesus enters this man's life and doesn't just give him salvation in eternity, but utterly and totally transforms him. He's in his right mind, fully clothed, Sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is the posture of a student. Jesus heals his life. Jesus restores this man. What nobody else could do. Everyone else in the village is saying, just just give him space. Stay away from him. Don't go near him. He freaks us all out. He's dangerous. He's violent. Leave him alone. And yet Jesus goes to him because this man, too, is a son of God. This man, too, is one that Jesus came to save. You see, there is no person who is too far, who is too broken, who is too depressed, who is too bound by fear that Jesus cannot transform his or her life completely. This is what he does. He is savior of the world, not just the leader of a religious movement. He is the savior of the world. And his name is not just beautiful and wonderful. It is also powerful. This is why at the conference, the woman is explaining, you know, my back hurts. And God says, anxiety, trauma. And she breaks down crying. Because God knows that her heart is bound by the trauma and she will not be free until he can pour out his love into that brokenness. And he brings it to the surface so that she knows that God in heaven was not absent when the trauma occurred. But he's been working in her life to bring her to that place where he could begin the healing process. This is what Jesus does. Our Savior is alive. And he can transform anyone. The people are terrified. And they don't want Jesus. They don't want Jesus to come in. They've they've seen what has happened. They say, please, leave us. Go away. And we need to be careful that we don't have that response. When Jesus does things we don't expect, when we're not, that we're not looking forward, that make us uncomfortable. If it's Jesus, we want it. This should not surprise us that Jesus does this because in Isaiah 61, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, 700 years before he came, this is what Isaiah wrote about him. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's Jesus because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are abound. Anxiety is a prison for some people. Fear is a prison for some people. Negative self-hatred is a prison for some people. And Jesus came to set us free. And he didn't stop setting people free when he died on the cross. His ministry didn't end when he went up to heaven. He is still doing this. He is still accomplishing this. 
The problem is that the church of God doesn't realize that that's what the head of the church does. You see, we are the hands, we are the arms, we are the eyes, we are the mouth of Jesus Christ. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. And if the body is lame, if the body is crippled, the head is a little limited. But if we will come into alignment with Jesus, if we will say, Jesus, this was your mission to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. There's power in your name. If we'll make ourselves available, God can start setting people free. I was astounded by how many people came to the arena. People desperate to be touched by God. People desperate to find healing. People desperate. There was a, a, a college-age girl who talked about anxiety, and we were praying for her. And in my spirit, I, you know, in my heart, I just sensed that she had attempted suicide or wanted, was thinking about killing herself. And I said, have you ever thought about killing yourself? She said, yes. What is Peter Palma going to do about that? Nothing. I don't know how to help this woman. But Jesus does. Jesus knows what she needs. And Jesus is the one who, who orchestrated that moment so that we could be there and we could say, no. Your life matters. No, Jesus has a plan for you. No, God has a good future for you. No, you're not worthless. No, you are precious. God loves you. And it hit her heart and she was able to receive it. And a girl who walked into that arena thinking God doesn't care about me. God doesn't know me. I wonder if I should kill myself is touched by God's people, his love through his people, and her life is now, can be transformed if she'll walk in the truth, if she'll take the word. Let me tell you, the word in the Bible is not going to do you much good until it's in your heart. But when it's in your heart, it's the truth that we stand on. It's the truth that we live by, that God loves you, that he has a purpose for your life, that God can heal you, that he can transform you in ways that you do not understand. But you got to get it in your heart. And you can have an encounter with God in a moment. But it's the word of God that will transform your life. In that moment, God can lift the heaviness off you that, that's pushing you under the circumstances of life. And you can breathe. But it's the word of God that gives you the strength to swim. It's the word of God that allows you to navigate the challenges, the pain, the circumstances of life that are threatening to drown you. It's the word. And so a prayer, God can do miracles in a moment, but it's his word that we live on. It's his word that we eat. It's his word that needs to be our daily bread. This man is, is overwhelmed. He wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus doesn't let him. He says, I've got a mission for you. Go and tell your family and friends. Jesus gives restored people a mission. He heals people and then he sends them out. Because there are other lost people who need to be set free. And if we will not be the light in the city, who will? If we will not bring hope, who will? If we don't have faith in our God to transform any life, what God will? And people will continue seeking idols. Seeking money, hoping that it can heal the brokenness in their heart when we have the living God. We are his people. He can transform. He can heal. You know, one of the images, uh, and I'll close with this, so the worship team, you can, you can come on up now. Go ahead and come on up. We're going to close here with this illustration. 
In the 19th century, in the United States, along the Great Lakes, they began building rescue stations. So you had a a lighthouse. Lillian, you can just start playing. Had a lighthouse where light would go out to guide the ships. It would warn them of rocks where the ship could be wrecked, and it would guide them to safe harbor. They also had men on the watch. They were called surf men, and they'd walk the beach five miles one way and back, and they'd be looking for ships that were in distress. And when they saw a ship that was in distress, they'd launch a boat and go to rescue them. And so on one hand, there's light emanating from the rescue station, showing people the way to go. On the other hand, you have teams of people who, when they see someone in distress, go out to rescue. And this is the church. We've got the light. We've got a savior. We've got freedom from anxiety. We've got freedom from fear. We're loved. We're precious. We've got hope and a future. We've got everything the world is desperate for that they cannot find in sex, that they cannot find in money, that they cannot find in their career, that they cannot find from their family. It only can be found in God and we have him. And if we have been rescued... If we have been transformed, we need to go and tell. We need to go and tell. Because there's someone who is just like you 20 years ago. There is someone thinking about committing suicide. There's someone who thinks they are worthless because they've been abused. And they were told, you're trash. Nobody will love you. You'll never get married. You'll never have a family. And because that's what they've heard, that's what they believe is the truth. And and God is looking for someone to send to that young woman to speak truth, to guide her to freedom. Some people can follow the light. Other people, their life is shipwrecked and someone's got to go and rescue them. This needs to be TIC. That our light shines across the city. And not only does it shine out, but we go out. And the same freedom, the same love, the same joy, the same peace that we have been given, we show others it can happen to you too. What Jesus did for this man, he can do for you. What Jesus did for me, he can do for you. You too can be transformed. Maybe you need freedom. Maybe you're here today and you need freedom. God can give you freedom. Maybe you're free. God wants to use you to bring other people to freedom. And maybe you need to start saying, Lord, I'm available. Here I am. Use me. But what I experienced this last week on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights shouldn't just happen once a year. It should happen every Sunday in this auditorium. Every Sunday in this auditorium, there should be people whose broken hearts are getting healed. Whose bodies are being prayed for. Who are receiving encouragement. The name of Jesus is beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's powerful. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship you. We pray that you would heal our broken hearts. We pray that you would heal our broken bodies. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would use us in Taipei and Taiwan, to be a light, to guide people to our Savior. 
who can heal and transform even the most broken life. In Jesus' name, amen.